friends welcome back to my brand new channel sps tech as you know i have created this channel to discuss various topics like cow java data structures algorithms microservices design patterns machine learning so i'll be introducing our viewers to all of these topics one by one and today i have chosen machine learning in order to demonstrate machine learning i have chosen a simple machine learning algorithm which is called random forest so let's see what random forest is so let's get started Welcome to introduction to random forest and decision trees. So friends, random forest is basically a categorization technique, which means if you have a large set of data and you want to categorize it into some fixed categories, this algorithm can help you achieve that. It comes under the section of supervised learning. What is supervised learning? Supervised learning is that section of machine learning where you use historical data to train your model and then generate predictions for upcoming data. it's called random forest because it uses a random subset of data to train out decision trees so that's where the keyword random comes from and forest because it has a bunch of decision trees to generate predictions so that is where the name random forest comes from now coming to supervised learning supervised learning is the most common category of machine learning algorithm in order to achieve supervised learning we start with a set of data that we know the answer to then we split this data into two sets one is called the training set and the other is called the testing set and the general ratio between training and test set is 80 20 or sometimes it is even 70 30 so then we take our training set and we feed that training set into the machine learning algorithm so that it can train so if input is this the output will be this if input is this the output will be this this way the algorithm trains itself and once our model is trained we evaluate how efficient it is we use the testing set for it and then we feed the testing set and we match whether the predictions given by the model and the actual output are same or different what are the variations and then we calculate its efficiency so typically in step number 2 which algorithm we use to train our model differentiates our model from other models and in this case today we will be using random forest algorithm to train our model there are other popular algorithms as well like k nearest neighbor linear regression logistic regression etc the decision trees are the core components of the random forest algorithm a decision tree is simply a step by step process to go through to decide a category something belongs to so let's understand decision tree with the help of an example suppose you have a set of fruits and you want to train someone to categorize these fruits your set of fruits contain apples grapefruits orange plantain and banana so to teach someone to categorize these fruits we will use the features of the fruits for example we have the color apples are red they can be green they might be yellow as well oranges are orange grapefruit can be orange or yellow plantain is yellow and banana is also yellow. also we have the size of the fruit which which is in this case the length of the fruit in centimeters and the information whether it is easy to peel the fruit or not so the decision tree will help train this person to categorize the set of fruits into different categories using these features so this is how a decision tree looks as you can see we have used the features of the fruit to categorize it into different categories so at the top level we have used the color of the fruit whether it is yellow or not in case it is yellow we are using the size of the fruit whether it is long and skinny or not if no then it's an apple we can conclude that if yes whether it's easy to peel or not if yes then it's a banana and if no it's a plantain and moving to the left side if it is not yellow whether it's orange or not if it's not orange again it's an apple if it's orange it can be a grapefruit or it can be an orange as well again in this case we'll check the size of the fruit if it is a smaller than a grapefruit then it's a grapefruit and if it's larger than a grapefruit then it's an orange so this way using a decision tree we can classify a set of fruit starting from the top moving bottom on all the sides and when we reach the bottom we have our fruits classified into individual categories 
So we are using a set of rules to classify our fruits into different categories. It's not just for fruits. We can classify any categorizable item into different categories using a decision tree. Now, how do we achieve random forest from decision trees? A random forest is made up of a number of decision trees, each of which has been generated slightly differently. So all of the decision trees don't use all of the features available. All of the decision trees also do not train on all of the training data. And you know, while creating a random forest, we use multiple decision trees and then average out the result. So this averaging of result help us achieve our random forest from our given set of decision trees. So going back to the fruits example, you can see that we have plotted our fruits in an n-dimensional space here. So the square ones are oranges, the diamond ones are apples, the circled blue are grapefruits, and the triangle ones are bananas. Now if we try to classify these fruits using different decision trees, we get this result you can see that we have different decision trees which are marking different areas for different fruits. So it is marking the top left area for oranges in this case, whereas in the second decision tree, it is marking the top left area for grapefruits. So basically, decision trees classify the complete and dimensional space into different categories. And then when we do an averaging of the result of different decision trees, we get the following out. You can see that the area which are confirmed in a particular color are confirmed for a particular fruit. For example, the left bottom area is confirmed for an orange. The right bottom area is confirmed for bananas. The right top area is confirmed for grapefruits. And the area in the center is confirmed for apples. And you can see there is some amount of shaded area as well which you know is the case of dilemma. So no machine learning algorithm is perfect and it cannot give you 100% correct predictions. For example, the fruit line here in this case can be an orange as well or an apple as well. So how accurately your model can predict the categories correctly determines the efficiency of your algorithm. Now, how do we determine what percent of training data should we feed to each of our decision trees? We use the following formula for this. So this formula gives us the percentage of training data that we should be feeding to each decision tree. So for example, if we have 10 items in our training data, if we calculate the percentage using this formula, we get 65%, which means that we can either feed six items or seven items, because you cannot feed 6.5 items. So you can choose between six and seven, what amount of data you should be feeding to each of your decision tree. Again, for 100 items, if we calculate using this formula, we get 63%, which means that 63 items out of 100, you should be feeding to each of your decision tree. Again, if you try to calculate using 1,000 items, you will again converge to 63%. So basically, 63% is the converged amount of percentage of training data that you should be feeding to each of your decision trees. So friends, as explained to you earlier, we don't allow our decision trees to use all the features available. So at any branch of the decision tree, only a subset of the features is available to it to classify the data. And for selecting the number of features for a decision tree, we use a square root technique. For example, if we have a training set in which we contain apples and pears, and we have their features as weight, size, color and shape. So when we try to build our decision tree for apples and pears, since we have four features available, each of our decision tree will get the square root of four, which is two features to classify the data. So when we start building our decision tree, we can first choose between any two features, say for example, color or size. Supposedly, we choose size. Then on the second level of the decision tree, we can use another feature. Since we have already chosen size, we can choose between color, weight. So again, if let's say we choose color. So you know, we use the square root technique. So for example, if our, if our decision tree has five features, then its square root will come out to two point something. In that, you know, we'll converge it to two. 
and we'll allow each decision tree to you know use two features for classifying the data. So as you have seen, for each of our decision tree, we give them a subset of data and we give them a subset of features as well. So friends, for generating our random forest, we also need to decide how many decision trees we will be using in our random forest. To start with, more trees are usually better. But then we have to consider how much computing resource is available with us. If you take a lot of decision trees, your computer or your server where the algorithm is running, you know, can get overwhelmed and can get overloaded, the memory can crash. And increasing the decision tree is only true up to a point. After that point, the returns start to diminish. So after this point, adding more number of decision trees will not increase the efficiency of the algorithm. For example, going from 10 to 50 trees will certainly improve the result. But going from 1,000 to 5,000 trees will not add much improvement and also will increase the computing time. So this is in a way a trade-off between the computing time and the efficiency of the algorithm. This is where you know the role of the data scientist comes into play, where he has to decide the optimal amount of decision trees to be used in the random forest. So friends, no theory is complete without a practical. So here we are at our Jupyter notebook and I'll demonstrate you the random forest algorithm. So I'll walk you through the code and I'll also show you the output. So as you can see, this notebook contains the code for our random forest algorithm. I'll also like to mention to our viewers that you can find this notebook in my GitHub repository. I'll add the link for it in the description. So here what we are doing, we are importing NumPy as NP. So NumPy is basically a mathematical library of Python. Then we are in importing pandas as pd. Pandas is another uh, library which provides us data frames in Python. For people who are not aware of data frames, you can just imagine them as, you know, a big Excel file containing columns and rows for all your data. Then we are using psychic Learn library to import the iris flower data set. So this iris flower data set contains data for iris flowers, which are belonging to three categories. And there are four different features for these flowers. And we will use random forest to try to classify these flowers into different categories. Then again from scikit-learn, we are importing the implementation of random forest algorithm. From scikit-learn, we are also importing a method which is called train test split, which will help us to split our data into training data and testing data. We are setting a random seed to the NumPy. This will help us ensure that we get the same set of random data whenever we run this algorithm. Then, you know, we are reading the iris data into our iris underscore df data frame using pandas dot data frame method. As mentioned earlier, a data frame can be visualized as a big Excel file containing all our rows and columns. So basically our data. So we are calling the load iris method and loading the data available in the iris data set into the iris variable. Then we are creating iris underscore df data frame using the pandas or data frame method. And we are loading the iris data and its columns into a data frame. And we are also loading the results of the data, which means which flower belongs to which category into the iris underscore target data frame. So basically iris underscore df data frame contains the data for different features of each flower. And iris underscore target underscore df contains the result which means which flower belongs to which category just to show you our data i am calling the iris underscore df dot head as you can see it is showing us four features sepal length sepal width petal length and petal view so these are the four features of each of our flowers and you know we have to write an algorithm which would try to classify each of this flower into different categories so if i run iris underscore targets underscore head for the first 100 parameters, you can see it is classifying some of the flowers as zero, some as one. It will further classify some of the flowers as two, which means it's belonging to the second category. So basically one, two, three here are the different categories to which each of the flower belongs. Just to make clear to you, I'm showing you the size of the Irish data set. So you can see it contains 150 entries and each entry has four features. So basically it is a 150 cross four matrix. And if I show you the size of its target, you can see it is of size 150. So here 150 cross four is, you know, 
each entry of this row where there are four features for each entry and 150 here is you know 0 1 2 3 which means which flower belongs to which category so friends i had created these two data frames here just to show you the head of each of these data frames so that you are able to visualize what data is present in our data set so basically these data frames created here are just for visualization purpose now here the real action begins i am initializing the data in our x variable and the categories of this data in our y variable and then we are using our favorite method train test split to split this data into training data and testing data and since we are giving test size as 0.4 which means that training and testing data in the ratio of 6 is 2 means 60 percent of data will be training data and 40 percent of data will be testing data so you know we have created so x train and y train is our training data and x test and y test is our testing data now we initialize our model which is random forest classifier in this case and then we are asking our model to train itself is using the training data so we are passing the x train which are the four features for each flower and y train which is the result of category of each flower into our model.fit method so now we are passing our training data into our model and asking it to train itself using this model so here x train and y train is our training data so x train contains the, all the four feature features for each flower and y train contains the category to which each of the flower belongs and we are you know calling the model.fit method and asking it to train itself and once our model has trained we'll try to evaluate its efficiency so you will pass in the x test and y test which is our testing data to calculate how efficient our model is so if i run it you see i get 93 percent efficiency which means that it tested the model using this x test value and whatever categories it found for those data it compared it with their correct category which is present in y test and you know the efficiency of this algorithm came out to be 93 percent so friends you must have noted while initializing our classifiers we didn't specify the number of decisions so the default value of number of decision trees is configured as 100 here so this result of 93 percent which we have received is for using a random forest with 100 decision trees so if i try to increase the number of estimators here and if i let's say if i take it as thousand let's see what will be our result if i again train our model and again try to test its efficiency you see i get a better efficiency why because you know i've increased the number of decision trees in my random forest now let's see if i further increase the number of decision trees will the efficiency continue to increase or not now instead of thousand i have increased the decision trees to ten thousand i'll again call the fit and score method as you can see the, now it is taking more time to classify the data which is evident because you know it is generating a more number of decision trees and then trying to fit our training data and then evaluate our testing data as you can see the efficiency again reduced to 93 percent as explained earlier it is not always that if we go on increasing our decision trees our efficiency rules continue to increase there is a certain point after which you know there is no benefit of adding the decision trees or in fact our efficiency would start to decrease as well so friends do check out this notebook from my github repository and try it for yourself to get a feel of random forest algorithm so friends i hope you must have understood about machine learning and specifically about random forest if you like this video don't forget to give it a thumbs up and if you have not subscribed to our channel yet i request you to subscribe to my channel it gives me the right motivation to create more useful informative videos for you Till then it is SPS signing off. Take care. Bye bye.